You know, when when you're starting out in science, you don't really know very much, and uh, you just feel that this is something you want to do, um, and you fully realize that that it's not for money or fame that you're doing this. It's it's you're doing it because you have to do it because you're you're attracted to some aspect or maybe many aspects of of science um and it's also uh a career is is a a, a long uh uncontrolled experiment so uh you know yeah i there were these key decisions that i made usually based on insufficient information and um kind of you you kind of go on your feelings at first. I think now in the fullness of time, I think I, I I have more of a methodology that I have evolved that works for me. And um, but uh, back then and and in the early days, you're you're really you're just navigating. You're just floating down the river and you're trying to avoid the sharks and the the dragons and the water and heading towards things that look more attractive than maybe some some other things um and um i think i was always going to be a biologist um because i i really was fascinated by animals uh early on i i was thinking of being a naturalist but then i i went out in at the age of 10 or so in a spring in new england and I nearly froze to death and i i, I died and thought, well, maybe, yeah, maybe this is not, maybe this is not going to work for me. I, I want to be inside and warm and, you know, more comfortable than this. And then uh, that then evolved into a um, a really nice chemistry set that I had a, a, as a high school student and uh, participation in science fairs. And then I got a lot of good feedback in terms of those science fairs that uh, actually you know, uh, knew some things and won some awards. Um, but I, but then in college, um, there was an opportunity to do research in chemistry that wasn't obvious in biology. And so I took up those, some of those opportunities and, or one opportunity led to another opportunity that was better. And that turned out to be really good grounding, turned out to be really uh, chemistry, uh, especially organic chemistry, synthesis, which is what I was doing. Um, you don't have to know much. You just you just set up reactions and and learn how to distill things, and you're off and running. And you sort of have an immediate feedback for whether you're doing it well or not. And and actually, I was inspired uh, or maybe terrified by the, my boss at the time, who used to describe people who were clumsy in the lab as having the hands of a German shepherd, uh, meaning that they're really, they, uh, they were, they were lacking in lab skills. And, uh, and so that was kind of a, a, a goal to say, you know, okay, this is important. And, uh, and then he taught a, a lab course that I took where the whole grade was based on your yield and purity. There was like no written tests. There was no homework. You just got in the lab and you, took some unknown substance and you distilled it and you purified something whatever it was i don't yeah it wasn't important but but also the yield and purity you know do you have nice bright white crystals pure crystals or yellow slurry of uh, substances that were you know really not up to speed and was did you have a good yield and so that really taught it said that this is actually important and uh and and I could do that. That was, and I think that also carried through in a lot of other things that that um, you know gave me a good grounding in lab skills. And if you're doing experiments well, you're going to get results. And if you get results, that encourages you. That uh, makes you more confident of doing stuff. And and ever since that experience, I, I was able, when I was working in the lab, I could do things that other people could not do uh, for those for those skills. Um, and But then the other thing was I, I eventually got tired of chemistry. As I said, I was always meant to be a biologist, I think, and, and the mysteries of biology 
which were not obvious to me in chemistry. So, so I gravitated to my last year in college. I gravitated into a, a, what was a really perfect lab to be in, which was a biophysics lab uh, under uh, Professor Michael Beer at Hopkins. And um, they were trying to sequence DNA. And it, and it didn't work. It was a very, it was a big project and, and rested on a, a super microscope that they were building. And ultimately was not successful. And my time in the lab was not incredibly successful either. Um, unlike chemistry, where I had like two papers that were published in my chemistry lab experience. Um, but the idea of DNA and the idea of sequencing DNA at that time, before anything like this was possible, uh, but just the what could happen if you could sequence DNA and if you could understand genes uh, in a way that that no one understood them at that time. So that sort of prepped me for graduate school at Caltech, where, um, and that was another key decision that I, I gravitated towards a very prominent professor who was working in sea urchin development and gene expression and sea urchin development. And that attracted me because I was like, okay, this is, these are genes, this is genome, there's, there's stuff here, or there are a lot of mysteries. Uh, but then that just didn't work out that that the, the professor and I just didn't get along. And, and you do something you don't normally want to do as a graduate student is that after two and a half years in that lab, I uh, was encouraged and and was eager to to leave that lab and go to another lab. And luckily, that was another huge break because uh, recombinant DNA was just happening. My that professor was not letting me do recombinant DNA, but then I could jump to another lab that was, and and it was an immunology lab. And so that got me out of searchant development, which is a nothing field. This is a field that was is historically important and uh, that had a history and uh, so forth, but, but it was totally not the right field to be in, in terms of recombinant DNA and all the possibilities there. But immunology was absolutely the right field. It was, was exploding. Uh, Tanigawa had just shown uh, immunoglobulin rearrangement was happening. Uh, so that was that was an incredible uh, opportunity. Um, and again, you're, you're a kid, you don't really know really how things are going to develop, but you just have to go with your gut and say, oh, wow, this is it's a really happening field. Uh, we could maybe do something. It doesn't guarantee you can do something, but but getting in on the ground floor. And the other good thing at the time was that Tom Maniatis, who was a leader in developing recombinant DNA technology at Cold Spring Harbor and Harvard, was forced to leave Harvard because the Cambridge City Council banned recombinant DNA in its infinite wisdom because of, of the horrible dangers that never been materialized. And uh, and so he he was looking for a new gig. He chose Caltech. And he just brought a lot of modern technology and 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 stuff. And he was also very community minded. So we had basically multiple uh, lab groups got together and and discussed the latest um, advances. I knew all his graduate students, um, and uh, we were able to uh, quickly pick up on technology. And there, actually, my background in the previous lab helped a lot because I had done a lot of nucleic acid chemistry before recombinant DNA. And chemistry is about knowing the rules for a particular type of molecule. And DNA and RNA had been always kind of a mysterious thing you couldn't do much with because they were all very much the same chemically. But then recombinant DNA came along and then you could dissect what was what, but you could use the chemical principles to manipulate them and I found I could do that really well because of that background, uh, maybe the previous chemistry and then the nucleic acid chemistry. A lot of people doing recombinant DNA at that time didn't have that background and, and they were not as good uh, at using or, or knowing how to use the recombinant DNA technology. And that, that went on to the, like, the next really important thing was, what do you do after this? So we did a lot of work 
in uh, the, it's a lab of Leroy Hood. Uh, we did a lot of really good stuff in immunoglobulin gene rearrangement. Uh, and then it was time to move on to a postdoc. And uh, there I was very fortunate. Uh, one is that my girlfriend, later wife at the time, had just moved to NIH. And I was looking for a lab at NIH that I could work in, in immunology. And also I was trying to think of like, okay, what could I do? Um, and I got, uh, luckily I was steered towards uh, uh, William Paul, who was a very prominent cellular immunologist at the time and uh, head of a department at NIH of immunology, the most prominent immunology department at NIH, so several. And he was just very accommodating. He, they really wanted someone that could do recombinant DNA. Not many people could at that time. And uh, he gave me tremendous freedom and uh, to operate. Uh, but again, you make choices as to like, well, what do you do exactly? And um, and I had already made a choice to not do what everybody else was doing. I, I, I just, you know, I said, there's an art here. And if you're an artist, it's degrading to just, just be copying what other people do, that I wanted to forge my own path and do things that other people wouldn't think of doing or couldn't do technically. Um, and, and, and again, recombinant DNA gave people who knew how to use it uh, tremendous tools to reinvent fields like immunology. And, um, but I also knew what I didn't like. And I, I didn't like some of the complex immunology that, that was involved in a field called topoisomerases about twisting DNA and stuff. It was a very heavy duty field and interesting in, in a lot of ways, but I didn't like how people did experiments. Not, not because they were bad, they did brilliant experiments. I just didn't get that, how I would do those experiments. But what I could do is I could do gene expression analysis and and look at gene subsets and uh, and came up with uh, an idea for a whole series of experiments to define what genes were specific for B cells and what genes were specific for T cells. And I worked out a whole technical way to do that. And, and Bill gave me you know tremendous latitude to do that. And that, that's what led to cloning the T cell receptor gene. Um, in it at NIH, and that was our first T cell receptor gene, and that was a big deal. That was that was like a huge bottleneck in the whole field of immunology. And then, you know, this this uh, young person, you know, was all the big labs were trying to do this, uh, but they were all trying to do it in roughly the same way. I mean, again, there was this uh, tremendously monochromatic. Um, People, you know, deciding, oh, okay, this is the way we we should do this, and and then everyone does it that way, and I just thought, no, that's, I'm, you know, it may not work for me, but I'm going to do it in this this other way, and it turned out this that was better, that was better, faster, cheaper, could do it with just a few people, which is all I had uh, at NIH, um, and then the other big break is that when. I got an offer at Stanford. I got several offers, but the one at Stanford was the most appealing because Stanford was also a center of recombinant DNA in those days. And uh, and then my big break was that my wife uh, uh, at NIH, who had been doing something completely different, uh, said, "Well, you know, you can't do this alone. You know, you're you're <laughs> you <laughs> you need my help." And indeed, I needed her help. And and so we set up a, basically a mom and pop lab at Stanford and uh, and then fought off uh, tremendous competition because everybody wanted a piece of the T cell receptor and all the big molecular labs had been skunked uh, by me mostly and uh, they were not happy about that and they were they were come they came charging in you know once you publish and distribute uh, clones and sequences it's a fair game for everyone. And so, um, so there was a lot of competition, and uh, and it was really important that we had uh, that my wife and I could uh, fend that off. You know, we just had a, a growing lab, but but we could train people quickly um, in what they need. Nobody knew how to do this, so we had to train all the people. So, 
at the end of the day, so we ended up uh, publishing seven papers in Nature in 1984. And, and convincing most of our competitors that they didn't want to mess with us. You know, chart your own path. Don't, don't um, try to mimic people. Don't, don't try to do last, the last decade's big experiment. You got to move on. The, 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 this decade's experiments are going to be different than the last decades. And, and so being too focused on what worked before is a trap. Basically, the other thing I I, uh, I quote Bob Dylan as saying, uh, "Don't follow leaders, watch the parking meters." And and the thought there is, uh, leaders are already underway. They have followers. They have things in the pipeline that you don't know about. Uh, to find something different, uh, especially if you're starting out. You don't want to. Um, you know, I only survived in those early days because we already had a lead and, and we had expertise and, and could move quickly. Um, uh, if you're just starting out, you've got to find something that is different and valuable. And so I tell people, um, don't ask what's the next step in a field because then that, that's usually something obvious and the, their followers and the leaders are already on that. Uh, ask what's missing from this picture. You know, uh, scientists like everyone else tend to be herders and they tend to follow in travel in flocks. Uh, but really look for what are people not doing in a field? What are they not thinking about? What's missing? What's missing in this field and yet should be there? Because that, you know, it, it, you you probably never attended a lecture where someone just gets up there and said, well, we're going to just have 50 minutes of silence because we don't know anything about this field. But no, they're going to fill, fill the space with what they think they know. Uh, and so there isn't a lot of emphasis on what we don't know, because that makes you look stupid, right? It's a, no, one, no one wants to be stupid. But at the end of the day, that's, what, that's where the gold is. That's, um, that's where you can really... Uh, make an impact you know i think part of part of a scientific career is like what kind of impact do you want to make do you want to just be one of you know laying a few extra bricks on the structure or do you want to be more ambitious and think think okay here is something that could be really important in this field i mean you don't know because you don't have you know hasn't been developed but but head towards something that looks like it could be very important and then find out if it is. And if it isn't, then move on to, to something else. Peer appreciation is really important. I, I, I would say that in, in a scientific career, you, you run into a lot of discouraging things, experiments that don't work, things that you thought were important that might not be important, or you have a good idea and you open up a journal and you find someone else already had that idea and already is well along on working on it. Um, and also criticism. Criticism is a very important aspect of science. You know, you can ask why has science advanced? Why, why is science one of the very few cultural activities of human beings that every year there's visible advancement from the year before? And I think part of that is that we're very critical with ourselves and with everyone else.